finally we will we go to the we can move to the yeah. emancipatory knowledge the most interesting part of our research <coughs> and i think this is the most uh, striking discovery we have made thanks to a very very rich material we are very proud to present um, the discovery we uh, we have we have called here always on versus always off paradox following the publication by Almut uh, McDowell and Gail Kinman on Always On Paradox. So we developed this idea here and we add an extra element to the paradox or, or just we uncover this element uh, Always Off also which is uh, relevant to the system functioning and we actually believe that Always On is impossible without Always Off. Um, this kind of dichotomy um, uh, stems from the way institutions and the, the Western societies are designed, as Foucault, Michel Foucault stated in his writing, and what he called biopower. But what does it mean at the practical level? What, how is it experienced? As regards always on academics, uh, they are expected to be constantly available day and night, during the week, uh, working weeks, but also over the weekend and sometimes during the holidays. Some of them spend the, the, the entire holidays uh, to write papers or to, to do research. We have been to be pressured to be available to everyone all the time. That it's not pleasant, uh, this feeling of being obliged to be available. Uh, once they have needs, and they have demands or in terms of resources or in terms of process flows or something else, uh, when they address the, the university, they find themselves stuck in the plethora of procedures, rules, forms to fill, and sometimes it requires you to, um, like to contact five people in different administrative units and departments to sign a very, very simple paper, uh, like it was my case, for example, to get an authorization to travel abroad, um, um, I waited for two months, like it was signed by different people just to, to come here to spend two days in London, that's it. In a classroom is a devil of a job. The procedures today are extremely stereotyped, centralized and computerized. I have to make a request all day long. I have to have a watch on my request. I am enslaved to the procedure. This is, this is actually, this is about platform. It's got completely inhuman. So if we have requests, we, we have to connect ourselves on a virtual platform and then to formulate our request. And very often we get a response, like for example, it was my case uh, like a week ago. Um, I've asked to install a, um, a particular software for my statistical classes and they answered me, oh no, it's not possible. You, you should have formulated your request in May. It's too late. The system is uh, irresponsive not only to us, not only to academics, but also to students. And given that we are constantly um, uh, in, in the interaction with our students, we uh, are expected to solve many problems we are not concerned with regionally so we solve our problems and the problems of our students also how um, can it be explained vitalist system sustains individual in the state of imbalance so that they are forced to produce and to perform relentlessly in the search of the inexistent balance so it's a paradox which cannot be solved at the current state um, we try to um, explain um, the paradox of always on versus always off by an incredible power hegemony. So we um, go to the writings of Michel Foucault in doing so, also by, uh, to the works of Gramsci, uh, to the works of critical theorists as well, like Alveson and uh, Wilmot. And um, it's, the power uh, issue. it's a power issue. We cannot say no, so we end up suffering from it somehow. So that's also an organizational issue. Academics themselves remark the hidden move towards the neoliberal model, which does not necessarily uh, work in the context of French academia. Quite often they use the metaphor of machine. Um, they feel depersonalized from the university, and university is perceived as uh, like something mechanical and even unhuman, which cannot take into account our human nature. Which uh, evolved from an, an autonomous model to a pseudo entrepreneurial model. We do not necessarily produce any wealth. 
Why such a huge machine? So power distance is also such that they feel themselves useless, unable to act or simply uh, lacking the necessary resources to act. Given its huge, we do not know who is in charge for it, who govern, governs it. We notice also that the notion of struggle is uh, very present in the discourses of uh, the French academics. They really feel the opposition between the system and themselves. And this opposition in terms of power, which is available somewhere on the top, but which uh, they don't have at their individual levels, makes them lose the initial meaning of their job. So struggling with the system is resource consuming and as a consequence, they constantly fall into the imbalance trap. It's a fight we live almost every day to defend our job. So we were looking for the in-depth explanation of such a power asymmetry, uh, which uh, lays beyond the imbalance, which is inherent uh, to the system, which, which is already here. And it's not a matter of uh, your individual choice. It's not a matter of your boundary management strategy. It's something else. Uh, so uh, we would like to uh, address, uh, we decided to address the French language literature in sociology and in public administration. And this literature says that the current state of the French university, which is characterized by the imbalance that academics experience at no choice, uh, is rooted in the, the new public policy which concerns higher education in France. Since 2007, there have been published several decrees and laws which seem to give more autonomy, more flexibility, more financial independence to the French universities. But in reality, they cover the attempt to introduce the new public management which uh, France borrows from the United Kingdom, which has been developed by Margaret Thatcher at, uh, at her time, which means quantifying everything with no room for independent thinking. We conclude that the university is not anymore considered a knowledge producer, but it is rather considered a profit maker. Some of our colleagues qualify the recent actions taken by the state as a prescription to die, and I preferred <coughs> to the uh, publication of my <coughs> colleague from Exmasse University, which is called Mort sur Ordonnance, Death on Prescription. But it's not finished. What is interesting is that French academics um, think about the ways uh, social change can be brought uh, in. And uh, they also think about their uh, own resources they can engage in, in producing such a change. Um, the black picture we have painted here may, may, be, may look quite uh, depressive and you may wonder whether the change is possible at all. We still hope, yes, it is, because uh, we have identified some solutions which are suggested by academics themselves. This is, the, these are not our solutions, but these are solutions that come from people, that come from the, from the experts. So even if they feel exhausted, even if they internalize uh, normative discourses quite often and deeply, if, even, the, even if they don't feel psychological ownership towards the university, but still towards their jobs, <laughs> They do still have intellectual autonomy, hopefully, because they do belong to the intellectual elite. So we hope that those solutions can work one day. What are those solutions? The first one consists in reconsidering priorities. And it's not a matter of individual. The priorities are not to be reconsidered at the individual level. They should be reconsidered at the level of the whole university. And we have to go back to our initial missions to produce and to disseminate knowledge. The second solution um, uh, refers to the way our within job boundaries are defined. So we have to redefine within job boundaries so to decrease the existing internal in role conflict between teaching, research, and administrative work. So academics 
um, just hope to go back to the job content as they uh, as it is defined by the laws and the decrees 50% to research and 50% to teaching. Our working time should be also reduced and we are uh, expecting to come back to, to a 35 hours week as it's stated. The fourth solution refers to the procedures which are too complex and which in, uh, engage too many people in too many different units. And finally, the fifth solution is about working conditions. People do not have individual offices. They would like to, to have any. They would like to get um, the softwares to uh, conduct a, a high quality research and they would like to get an appropriate equipment. That's it. So, here is the stage of participant validation we have conducted according to the critical theory principles and I, uh, I let Kata and Ren talk about it. So this is our final step of our research. In order to have consistency between the participant perception and our conclusion, um, the participant validation was an essential step. We gathered the responses in three categories um, uh, based on technical knowledge, practical knowledge, and investigatory knowledge. Okay, on conflict and work-life balance, they confirmed uh, that the workload is uneven and the administrative part is predominant and they are always put in urgency situations. The academics said the workload is very uneven depending on individual, the administrative aspects prevents um, us from spending more time on real job. Academics aren't able to disconnect because they are confronted with many emergencies. Unfortunately, the consequences on work-life balance are usually very negative. On the consequences, uh, yeah, on the consequences, um, the pressurization has an impact on the help and restrain their work satisfaction. It emphasizes their stress and it's a higher risk for their lives. On career stage and boundary management, um, they realize most of the time too late. The importance to partitioning to be able to stand back for better uh, work-life management. I know that at some point in my career, I said to myself, that I was taking on too much. Everything took over on my private and personal life. I had to be able to say no and pull up barriers. The only strategy of protection is to detach. Now on the on-off paradox, it refers to the gap between the lack of consideration from the institutions towards academic and the institution's expectation of academic to be constantly on. It's regarding the asymmetry between the slow responses of the university and the expectation to stay entirely available. We received orders from the administrative body while having the feeling that there's no consideration of all our obligations and our workload. So in the end, their opinion uh, seems to be consensual. They agree with our results. Uh, the major elements always came back, and it is indicators of how uh, this aspect prevails and affects their lives. 